way would be a tribe that was exclusively giants. And what we're talking is about one tribe being three and a half feet tall on the average with very little diversity in height next to a tribe that was seven feet tall on the average, again with very little diversity of height. And my point here is a point we make in this book is that we need to take into account cultural factors. Uh, this conclusion that the human species originated from Eastern Africa makes the assumption that we migrate randomly just like the other animals and that we maintain cultural diversity randomly. Well, I would argue that because of our advanced spiritual nature, we don't behave like the other animals. We do not migrate my, uh, randomly and we don't set up random cultures. And for example, what we see with the Africans is they practice uh, their separate ethnicity. Whereas the rest of the world, it was quite common to have intermarriage between different population groups. The Africans have uh, kept that. In fact, there's considerable worry now amongst uh, geneticists that the fact that the Africans no longer practice this uh, ethnic separateness uh, means that this DNA evidence is rapidly going to disappear. In fact, the next 20 years is our window of opportunity. 20 years from now, this kind of research will no longer be possible. The human species will be too mixed up eth ethnically. I mean, I live in the Los Angeles area, and that's where you see tremendous ethnic mixing. Um, racial diversity means nothing in who you choose for uh, uh, a marital partner. But it still is a factor in Africa. But it's much less of a factor today than it was even 30 years ago. And this is going to impact our capacity to do this kind of study. Can you just tell us what happens when you you do these analyses, but you pass through that bottleneck of the time of Noah. Is that, how does, well, how I'm going to get to that. Uh, that's part of our model. It's uh, what referred to, oh boy, I've lost my cursor again. There it is. Okay. It's called the Younger Adam Paradox. Uh, let me just finish the story in the Garden of Eden. Okay. If you take into account that we humans do not migrate randomly, that leaves the door open that there might have been a non-random migration early from the Middle East into Africa, and once in Africa, there is a practice ethnic separateness that would completely explain the mitochondrial DNA location of human origins in Africa and the Y chromosome location in Africa. And uh, so taking that into account, uh, we would realize that this out-of-Africa hypothesis is completely consistent with the Garden of Eden being in Mesopotamia. Although uh, my co-author, Fuzzle Rana, he's the biochemist who co-authored this book with me, also makes the point that uh, you could actually interpret uh, the Garden of Eden passages in the Bible to be compatible uh, with Eastern Africa if you wanted to. Uh, but I would argue that there is no need to do that. Simply recognizing that humans are non-random migrators is adequate, and especially when you see in the text that you've got God forcibly uh, imparting on human beings a migration pattern that they did not intend. But in terms of the Younger Adam paradox, what geneticists have done is to try to look at very stable populations and compare the mitochondrial DNA date uh, with the Y chromosome date. And in this case, they assume heteroplasmy, which means they're dividing the mitochondrial DNA dates by three. And the whole point is they were trying to ensure that the mitochondrial DNA date was consistent with the Y chromosome date on the assumption that the first man lived at the same time as the first woman, which seems like a very reasonable assumption to make. That's a demanded assumption, as a matter of fact. But when, in fact, they did these studies, and what I mean by stable populations are populations where there's very little migration in or immigration out. And some good examples would be the Finns, the Estonians, uh, the Japanese, the Armenians, and the Jews. Those are population groups that have not tolerated uh, much mixing with other people groups. And every time you do that, what you observe is that the mitochondrial DNA date, even with heteroplasmy, is several thousand years previous uh, to the oldest possible date for the Y chromosome. And this is called in the scientific literature the Younger Adam Paradox, that Adam appears uh, to be 
uh, or Eve appears to be on the scene uh, three to 5,000 years uh, before Adam shows up on the scene. And this is viewed as something that's impossible for good reasons. Yes, need to change the tape? Okay, I'm going to let you change the tape. And then we'll pick this up. I'll take a question. I'll repeat it, sure. Yeah, it is the same region. Yeah, it's the identical region. I'm simply making the point that if you acknowledge non-random migration, uh, then it doesn't necessarily have to be that region, but it does have to be a single region, and it does have to be a region that's relatively close to that. So it could be Egypt, it could be the Middle East, uh, it could be uh, Persia, uh, but it's not going to be China or Australia. <clears throat> Okay, the Younger Adam Paradox. How when you look at these stable populations, Estonians, Finns, uh, Japanese, Armenians, or Jews, uh, we notice that you consistently have the first woman living thousands of years before the first man. Now, you had a great insight there that this is exactly what you'd expect from a biblical perspective uh, because what the Bible actually teaches in the flood account is that the human species is descended from eight people on board Noah's Ark. But notice the difference between the men on board the Ark and the women on board the Ark. The men are blood-related to one man, uh, Noah. And therefore, from a biblical perspective, we would expect a Y-chromosome bottleneck, not at Adam, but at Noah. In other words, from a biblical perspective, what these geneticists are measuring is the time back to Noah, not the time back to Adam. They should, in fact, refer to this as the Y chromosome Noah, not the Y chromosome Adam. On the other hand, the four women on board the ark are not blood-related to one another. They are the wives of Noah and his three sons. Therefore, in that case, we could have the mitochondrial uh, DNA uh, first woman easily go back thousands of years, perhaps even all the way back to Eve herself. But only from a biblical perspective uh, would we predict that you would have a date of thousands of years younger uh, for the first man than you would for uh, the first woman. So this is a wonderful uh, genetic tool we have, not only for putting to the test the theology of Genesis 1 through 3, but also the theology of Genesis 6 through 9. In fact, of all the scientific tests I can think of uh, for testing the flood account of Genesis, this is by far the best. Uh, now, you know, there are other creationists out there saying that they've got good tests for the Genesis flood, uh, but in my opinion, uh, these tests are not credible, and I document this in this book, The Genesis Question. But this genetic evidence, I think, is very credible and is one of the ways, uh, really the only way we have uh, to test the date uh, for the Genesis Flood, and uh, also uh, to test the historicity of the Genesis Flood. Hey, I'm going to allow the rest of the time uh, for questions and discussion, uh, but one of the things I want to remind you is that um, we maintain a daily telephone hotline at our office. If you're like me, I always think of my best questions uh, two or three weeks later, and uh, please take advantage. You can call us and talk to us. Or if you've got some atheist down the street that's giving you a hard time, we'd rather talk to the atheist. Uh, we've led quite a few to Christ over our, our hotline. And also, if you're interested in the subject of the latest scientific evidences for the God of the Bible, uh, every week we do a worldwide a live webcast. Uh, that's 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, we talk about the scientific discoveries of the past week but we invite people to call in, we take emails, and hey, if that's not a convenient time for you, we archive every single webcast, and we give you detailed notes so that you can pick up just that 10-minute segment you're interested in, and we also give you hot links to the research papers so you can see for yourself uh, what these research papers are saying. And finally, you'll see at the book table we're making available, oh, by the way, you may be interested in this, um, we have uh, fully accredited uh, graduate-level courses on apologetics. 
that uh, we're offering uh, through the web. They're fully interactive, both with the professor 